appreciate it. We're going to move, Winston and I are going to move this over. Cove Church, I, I want to um, direct your attention to a couple things on the tables for you. <coughs> um, we've been developing some Lenten tools um, over the last couple of years, so you'll see an almsgiving guide, a, um, a fasting guide, and then we're layering in uh, the prayer guide. Why would we do this? The reason is, um, I'm not sure if you knew this knew this or not, but um, Lent is set on the chassis historically of three things. Prayer, uh, almsgiving, and, and fasting. And so these are not exhaustive, just kind of kind of a, a cursory review uh, that will help you engage the Lenten season over the next six weeks. Again, want to say thank you to the Kofflers, thank you to Ken, Carrie. I saw Don in there helping. I'm, I'm so grateful uh, for the meal back there. Uh, in his book, Ancient Future Past, author Robert Weber said this, Lent calls us back to God, back to the basics, back to the spiritual realities of life. And whether you realize it or not, Lent is situated in the church calendar in such a way that it prepares our hearts for Easter. Um, the, kind of this 40 days of Lent, that number in Scripture, 40 days, 40 is important, 40 years for the children of Israel wandering around in the desert in preparation to inherit the promised land, 40 days in the wilderness for Jesus being tempted before he's launched into his ministry. And so the Lenten season, as it prepares us for Easter, it's a way for us to engage the wilderness. Now, I don't know about you, but um, I grew up in a kind of a denominational stream where we, di we didn't celebrate the Lenten season. It was just, it was just like Easter's here in its celebration. Easter, uh, or the, the Lent season, that's kind of like, you know, high church liturgical mumbo jumbo. And uh, we, we, you know, we just, we just didn't do it. What's interesting about that, Cove Church, is that, that the Lenten season, what it does is it allows us to embrace the cross. See, oftentimes we want the oasis of Easter without the weariness of the wilderness. You see, we want to celebrate Easter, but we don't want to go through Good Friday. Right? And we can't have Easter without the way of the cross. This, it's the cruciform life. It's the way of Jesus. And some in here might say, well, Pastor Brandon, Jesus went to the cross, so, you know, I, so I don't have to, obviously. Why, I get to just celebrate and joy and peace and healing and all that. That is true. And yet the same Jesus who went to the cross for us also said in Luke 9, 23, if anyone would come after me, that person must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow after me. The Apostle Paul said, I've been crucified. With Christ, And so I love the Lenten season where we get to embrace this idea of kind of less is more, the way of the cross, giving up something physical, perhaps for the sake of something spiritual. And what's interesting is when we will embrace, see we, Cope Church, um, we've got to keep both feet planted in the celebration of Easter, the most pivotal day in human history, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We also have to, all at the same time, we have to keep both feet planted in the way of the cross, the way of the desert, the way of the wilderness. Good Friday, if you will. The Lenten season teaches us that. It helps us with that. So um, the, the thought that we had, kind of this idea of the wilderness, back to basics, if you will, gave, gave rise to this idea. Instead of breaking into groups, let's all gather and study the basics of Jesus, the firsts of Jesus, there are six or seven of them in Scripture. We're going to study six over the next six weeks. We'll start tonight with first remove the plank from your own eye. And so what I want to do tonight quickly, I'm going to move very quickly. I want to start with Jesus, then move to the Apostle Paul. I'll tie the two together, and then we'll break into some table discussion for about 15 minutes, and then we'll come back up, do a drawing, and we'll get you home 
get, get ready for tomorrow. And so I'm going to borrow heavily from one of my favorite authors. In fact, my favorite book on spiritual formation is this one called Invitation to a Journey, Dr. Robert Mulholland. Uh, and at the end of the night, we'll give away uh, that raffle ticket. That's the other thing I probably need to call your attention to. Along with the plank there in the middle of your table, uh, applies to the scripture, but the, um, uh, you're going to want that raffle ticket. We'll raffle off a couple of the books. Matthew chapter 7, verses 3 through 5. This is the Sermon on the Mount, if you're unfamiliar with your Bible. I wish I could get into the context, but the context around the Sermon on the Mount is really important. Jesus says this, Why do you see the splinter that's in your brother or sister's eye, but don't notice the log in your own eye? How can you say to your brother or sister, let me take the splinter out of your eye when there's a log in your eye? He says this in verse 5, You deceive yourself. First take the log out of your own eye, out of your eye, and then you'll see clearly to take the splinter out of your brother or sister's eye. Notice, he doesn't say not to take that speck out of your brother or sister's eye. He's just saying, start with your own stuff first. And often, Cope Church, the older I've gotten and the the longer I've pastored, the more I will deal with my own stuff before I go try to remove the speck in someone else's eye. And I, sometimes I have to have hard conversations as a pastor. We have to have hard conversations as Christ followers sometimes. But man, when I will spend time dealing with my own stuff, when I go to maybe talk about the speck in someone else's eye, not always, but the older I get, the more gentle, the more loving, right? Hopefully the more gracious when I go to do that. Now, let's jump to Paul. Put a pin in that. That's Jesus. Let's move to Paul. Romans 8, 10. Paul says this. If Christ is in you, two things are happening. The spirit is your life because of God's righteousness, but the body is dead because of sin. If Christ is in you. That's an interesting phrase. He, Christ, uh, Paul is a Christ follower. He's writing to Christ followers, but he says, if Christ is in you, two things are happening. And he uses this word body, but the body is dead because of sin. The Apostle Paul uses that word body three different ways in in his letters in the New Testament. The first is he refers, he'll use it to refer to the human body, uh, the body of Christ, number two. But number three, Romans 6, 6, there's a little bit more of an obscure way that he uses it. He says this, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin, interesting, the body of sin might, underline that word, might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Dr. Mulholland, in his book, would refer to this body of sin. That word, I'm not a Greek scholar of church, but that that Greek word is soma, how how Paul is using it. This body of sin. Uh, Dr. Mulholland would, would, would refer to this body of sin this way. It's a complex deeply ingrained network of habits and destructive ways of relating to the world. Huh. And here's what's interesting. In chapter 6, the Apostle Paul says, listen, that body of sin, Christ went to the cross that that body of sin might be done away with. Notice the word might. Remember that. And then in chapter 7, he outlines another painful truth a picture of the human condition see if you can relate maybe you've read it romans chapter 7 verses 15 through 24 so so in romans chapter 6 christ goes to the cross that 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 those deeply ingrained ways of relating to the world those harmful habits that harm us harm other people that might be done away with that we don't have to be enslaved to sin and then in chapter 7 two things can be true at one time he says this I don't know what I'm doing because I don't do what I want to do. Instead, I do the thing that I hate. But if I'm doing the thing that I don't want to do, I'm agreeing that the law is right. The law, he's referring to the Old Testament law. But now I'm not the one doing it anymore. Instead, it's sin that lives in me. I know that good doesn't live in me, that is, in my body. The desire to do good is inside of me, but I can't do it. I don't do the good that I want to do, but I do the evil that I don't want to do. 
But if I do the very thing that I don't want to do, then I'm not the one doing it anymore. Instead, it is sin that lives in me that is doing it. Verse 21, he says, So I find that as a rule, when I want to do what is good, evil is right there with me. I don't, can anyone relate to that? It's like, I want to do, do good, and then boom, there's my buddy, evil, right? Shoulder to shoulder. We're going to be buddies today. I gladly agree with the law on the inside, but I see a different law at work in my body. It wages war against the law of my mind and takes me prisoner with the, uh, with the law of sin that is in my body. I am a miserable human being, Paul says. One translation says, oh, wretched man that I am. And then he asks this haunting question, who will deliver me from this dead corpse? Another translation, there it is, body of sin. Who's going to deliver me from this body of sin? So here's, here's how Mulholland, he kind of puts a picture to this uh, church. He, he says, this is you, and this is you before Jesus. And, and what we, everything that we do in life before Jesus really is about one person. My relationships, the way that I view the world, the way that I handle my money, I don't know Jesus. I don't know any other way than to kind of live for myself. It's, it's my kind of kingdom. It's my empire. So, so what we do is we create this body of being, this way of being that is not according to Christ, but we don't know any better because we don't know Jesus. And then by God's grace, we come to faith in Jesus. And Mulholland poses this question, I want to pose it to you tonight. What then happens to this body of being, or what um, the Apostle Paul would call this body of sin? Maybe it's greed, or um, you know, selfishness, or it's, it's the way that we, we treat people, it's what comes out of our mouths, these things that do not look like Jesus. Now sometimes, when, when, we come, when we come to faith, sometimes there's that miraculous 180 turnaround, where the Holy Spirit just removes maybe that addiction in our life. Maybe, um, maybe uh, you know, I've all kinds of friends who would say, man, the moment I got saved, it was like my mouth, I just, I, I could swear like a sailor. I came to Jesus, and it's like it, it dried up. But, but they will find, that same person will find that there's this other kind of body of sin that's still there. Further, Cove Church, what Mulholland suggests is this. Here's the other person. And they, like you, have come to faith in Christ, but they also have this body of sin. <laughs> and often what we want to do is we want to go pick that little speck out of their eye. We want to try to peer through the plank that's in our eye to get that speck because that speck drives us crazy in them. And the Apostle Paul would come along and get the magnifying glass out, right? And he, wouldn't, he didn't say, oh, wretched person that you are. He said, oh, wretched man that I am. Who's going to deliver me from this body of sin? He puts the magnifying glass on himself. And Jesus would come along and say, listen, l let me just give you some of the basics in life. Before you try to go pull that tiny little speck that drives you so crazy out of the other person's eye, let's deal with the plank that's in your eye. Because if you try to go do that, you can't see very well. And you're going to hurt them, you're going to hurt yourself, and you're going to blow this relationship up. Back to the basics. Now, Mulholland would say this about spiritual formation. A couple of things. Number one, he gives this beautiful definition. Spiritual formation, all of us are in spiritual formation. Spiritual formation is the process. It's, that's one of our values at Cove Church, and I love that that's one of our values. It's the process of being conformed to the image of Christ for the sake of other people. I love that he hits that, it, that it's a process because when, when, we come, when we come to faith, this body of sin doesn't just evaporate. The Spirit of God is at work in us, putting his finger on these things, saying, listen, we're, we're going to work on this and conform this more and more to the image of Christ. That's number one. 
Number two, he, Moholland would say, we're all in the process of spiritual formation. There's no neutral. We're either becoming a beautiful picture, more and more, a beautiful picture of Jesus, or we're becoming kind of this marred caricature of Jesus. It's one way or the other. Number three, often, and I, and I like this, uh, Moholland would say, in the process of spiritual formation, when we come to faith, this body of sin, this plank in our eye, most of the time, not always, but most of the time, the Holy Spirit will put his finger on that which is most dissimilar to the image of Christ. And so maybe it's, I don't know, maybe it's greed, and it's the way we handle money. And the Holy Spirit would say, listen, we'll get to these things, but this one, boy, that, that, that does not look like Jesus at all. We're going to work on this, Brandon, in your life. Or maybe it's addiction. The Holy Spirit goes, we'll, we'll get to these other things, but we're going to start right here. We have a lot of work to do there. Okay. Now, some of us might say, Pastor Brandon, why, why, can't, why can't Jesus just touch me at my point of brokenness? Why can't he just erase all of that? I'm with you. I would love that. But I also love that he invites us into the journey and allows us to work with him. Paul left us with this haunting question, and he answers it Romans chapter 7. He says this, Thank God through Jesus Christ. Who's going to deliver me from this body of sin? Thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. There's the answer. We haven't talked about how yet, but there's the answer. And he says, so then I'm a slave to God's law in my mind, but I'm a slave to sin's law in my body. So now there isn't any condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. God has done what was impossible for the law since it was weak because of selfishness. God condemned sin in the body by sending his son to deal with sin in the same body as humans who were controlled by sin. He did this so that the righteous requirement of the law, the Old Testament law, might be fulfilled in us. Look what he says here. Now the way we live is based on the spirit, not based on selfishness. People whose lives are based on selfishness think about selfish things. But people whose lives are based on the spirit think about things that are related to the spirit. Summary, Cope Church, number one. Jesus is the answer. We can't do this on our own. Number two, we have a choice. We're no longer slaves to sin. In other words, we don't have to live that way. Remember in Romans 6, 6, where Paul said that, that this body of sin might, I had you underline that word in, in your mind, it might be done away with. We have agency in the process. We get to co-labor with Jesus in this. So, how do we get this done, Cope Church? I want to wind this down. Um, this is where the spiritual disciplines come in. And uh, it, I, I don't know how much you've heard about spiritual dis disciplines, but throughout the history of the church, you will hear like the classic disciplines, maybe three or four different spiritual disciplines like um, prayer, uh, spiritual reading, uh, Lectio, Lectio Divina, some of the Lectio journals, fasting, serving, uh, uh, Moholland would outline kind of three or four core spiritual disciplines. Uh, Ruth Haley Barton, who was a protege of um, Dr. Moholland, outlines kind of nine core spiritual disciplines. I'm reading another book right now uh, by a, a gal named Adele Kahlberg, and she outlines 75 spiritual disciplines. What's the point, Pastor Brandon? The point is a spiritual discipline can be just about anything that we offer up to the Lord that by His grace, it's a means of God's grace to help conform us to the image of Christ. It's a means of God's grace. I know that that word discipline can mess with us. If it helps you to just think of it as a spiritual rhythm, a spiritual cadence in your life, spiritual discipline. Throughout church history, Cove Church, um, the witness of the church, the pastoral witness, the, the mothers and fathers of the church would say that the answer to our desires, we didn't really desires, uh, and deadness, we talked a lot about deadness, this body of sin. 
the answer to this is the spiritual disciplines. And I would suggest that in our deadness, when we come face to face with our deadness, it actually creates a a desire in us where we go, I don't, I don't want to live that way either. I have a desire to live differently in my life. And the Holy Spirit would go, great. I have that same desire for you. It's going to be through the spiritual disciplines in your life. And again, we come back to, why can't God just come up and erase this? He could. And sometimes he does certain things, but then we're left with the rest. In Cove Church, the same Apostle Paul in Philippians 2, I love this verse. It's a paradox. It's a mystery in the Christian faith. He says this, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Then he goes on, For it's God who is at work in you both to will and to do. Well, Pastor Brandon, which one is it? Yes. It's, it's both. It's a, it's a mystery of our walk with Jesus. Who does the work? Yes. We, we engage the Holy Spirit with the, with the spiritual disciplines, and that's largely what God uses to conform us into the image of Christ. So let's bring this home. Maybe it's, maybe it's Cove Church. I just, I, I'm going to kind of turn the knife just a little bit. Maybe it's a food addiction. And the Holy Spirit would come along and say, we need to address this, you and I. Grace, grace, grace. Because I love you. And um, so we're going to engage the spiritual discipline of fasting. Or, or, or maybe, maybe I'm a workaholic. And I'm just grinding my body and my relationships into the ground. I'm missing appointments. I'm missing key, just kind of seminal moments with my family. And the Holy Spirit would come along and say, that, that's not me. That's not what I want for you. That's not my image. And so we're going to embrace the spiritual discipline of Sabbath and rest. Maybe it's greed or how we kind of steward our money. And the Holy Spirit would come along and say, listen, there's a lot of spending going on. It's like spend, 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 maybe save a little and maybe tip God at the end. We're going to flip that around and it's going to become give, save, spend. And so we're going to embrace the spiritual discipline of maybe tithing, budget, generosity, maybe lavish generosity. Maybe it's the words that come out of our mouth and the Holy Spirit would say, listen, here's the spiritual discipline, silence. We're going to practice silence. Maybe it's Maybe it's selfishness. And the Holy Spirit would come along, Jesus would come along, come along and say, listen, we're going to change this, and we're going to do it through the spiritual discipline of serving other people. So here's what I want to do, go to church. I want to just give you two minutes before we um, kind of release you into some table discussions. And I, I, just on your own, just between you and Jesus, I want you to ask the Lord, is there anything in this body of sin? David said this in Psalm 139. He cried out to God, search me and know me. Find any wicked way in me. Lord, is there anything you want to put your finger on tonight? And then number two, is there a spiritual discipline that, that, that you would want to offer up as well? And oftentimes, whatever the Lord puts his finger on really kind of points to what that spiritual discipline might be. All right, I'm going to give you just like two minutes, and then I'll release you into your table discussions. Take just a second with the Holy Spirit.
church. Um, here's here's what I want to do. You have a table discussion leader or leaders at your table. They're the ones with the lanyards on. They're awesome, and uh, they have a list of questions. Their their job is not to be the answer people, right? In fact, it's legal for them to say, "I don't know." What they're there to do is serve your table to just keep the discussion going. I would say this, if your default is to talk more, maybe talk a little less, give the person next to you an opportunity to share. If your default is to talk less, I would encourage you to speak up. We want to hear from you. I'm going to set a timer on my phone. We will go 15 minutes. I'll come back up. We'll do a drawing, pray for you, and get you out of here. Good? All right. We also have the questions for you up on the screen, too.